good morning to everyone joining us on this FJMC webinar. Uh, we thank you for taking the time. My name is uh, Norwin Marins. I'm a past president of the, of the FJMC Midwest region and responsible for scheduling many of the uh, FJMC webinars uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, we have the pleasure this morning of welcoming uh, Sandy Victor, and uh, I'll get into his uh, bio in just a minute. If you're seeking to improve your life in a variety of uh, areas, uh, hypnosis can help. Uh, Sandy is a certified hypnotist and has helped many people make life-altering improvements by breaking bad habits or positive changes. Uh, he will get into how he works with his uh, clients. Uh, Sandy is a member of Congregation Beth Judea in Long Grove, Illinois, a Northwest uh, Chicago suburb, where he's been a member for many years. And he is also a past uh, club president, men's club president at uh, Congregation Beth Judea and long active in its Midwest region, the FJMC Midwest region, serving as a past president and internationally in uh, various uh, roles, including judging uh, quality club uh, entries over the last several years. So uh, in terms of his uh, professional background, I mentioned he's a certified hypnotist and he is a member in good standing with the National Guild of Hypnotists and is certified obviously in that uh, area. Uh, he has been uh, working in the area of hypnotherapy for more than 40 years. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sandy Victor. We ask that everyone mute themselves to avoid any uh, background noise or distractions or barking dogs. Uh, the questions will be uh, uh, held until the end. And at that time you can uh, unmute yourself. And if you'd like to be on camera, you can do that as well. So I'll turn it over to Sandy uh, and uh, Hope everyone will find the presentation useful, helpful. If they have follow-up questions, you can contact Sandy uh, directly. And uh, this is being recorded. So if you know of people who would benefit, uh, please let them know that they can access it through the FJMC archive. So again, uh, my pleasure to introduce Sandy Victor. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, I'm gonna give a kind of a summary uh, of what uh, hypnosis is and how it can be used. Uh, for those of you who want to get hypnotized today, it's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're going to do, do that. There are rules and laws depending on where in the world you are on who can uh, do hypnosis. And since I don't know where everybody's from, I don't know what the laws and rules are for your location. So we're just going to stay out, off the whole topic and just talk about it and not do any hypnosis. Uh, I'll go over a little bit of what uh, Norwin mentioned. I uh, am a certified hypnotist through the National Guild of Hypnotists. I started doing hypnosis back in 76, actually uh, started practicing in 80. And... Uh, Became certified. Uh, please, please mute yourself. Everyone needs to mute themselves, please, out of uh, respect to what we're doing here. Okay. Uh, and became certified in 92. As far as uh, men's club experience, I was uh, president of Beth Judea's men's club, God, a long time ago. Uh, I was also Midwest uh, region president in 2005 to seven. I, uh, they honored me with the Masim Tovim Award in 2015. And since then, I've also been involved uh, in the F FJMC internationally as a uh, worldwide rap chairman, quality club chairman, and finishing up my term currently as uh, the Minion of Comfort co-chair. Let's go into a little bit of the history of hypnosis. Uh, hypnosis has been around for a very long time. Uh, in ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, uh, they did hypnosis. They didn't use that terminology in those days, but that's what they were doing. They typically had uh, the priests or religious leaders have people come to uh, various temples. They'd get in their robes and stuff like that and would somehow cure the faithful of whatever the many uh, illnesses they had. 
at that time. It got a little more interesting uh, in the mid uh, 1500s, 1600s, where uh, Father Gassner, it was in France, it was a Catholic priest, and there he used what they called exorcisms to remove demonic possessions. Uh, the Catholic Church wouldn't get into uh, dealing with hypnosis as uh, something else, but doing exorcisms and driving demons out was okay. So that's what he was able to do. One of the people who saw him doing that was Franz Mesmer. And uh, he took that idea of trying to remove demons uh, and came up with another way that was really more scientific in his mind was to use... Uh, this was due to magnetism. So he put people into tubs of water with iron in it and tried to magnetize their body forces, get them back in balance magnetically, and that would allow them to uh, relieve their suffering. Uh, there were a lot of investigations uh, in France at that time, uh, whether this was working and how it was working, and I know uh, Benjamin Franklin, for example, was in one of the commissions that investigated uh, what Mesmer was doing. And they basically came to the conclusion that, you know, this magnetic tub uh, and trying to fix uh, people by uh, fixing their magnetic fields wasn't really right. That's not what was happening. Uh, so he got debunked in a way. I mean, he was still doing good things, but the method, his explanation of why it was working was uh, thrown out. Uh, after that, uh, they came up with the Nancy School, uh, which was a couple other guys in France who sat there and said, it wasn't, you didn't have to be in a tub of water with iron to get the magnetic field. Magnetism was a universal uh, force that could be fixed by passing and balancing their uh, magnetic fields. Uh, I think Star Wars turned it into the force. Again, this was this universal life force that was around everybody. And if it was out of whack, you were out of whack. So they fixed it up uh, a lot of times by just passing your hands by them and trying to realign their the magnetic fluid that surrounded everybody. Uh, again, that got kind of uh, thrown out as not being you know, magnetism really had, didn't have much to do with it. And uh, James Braid in England uh, figured out that that was not what was happening. He coined the term hypnosis and uh, began hypnotizing people through uh, eye fixation, you know, watch the watch kind of thing, uh, and had nothing to do with magnetism anymore. At this about the same time, James Escadel uh, performed a lot of surgeries in England, uh, in India, sorry, using hypnosis and was able to do these surgeries without pain. Mm. And uh, that was uh, mind blowing for most people at that point. Uh, Sigmund Freud started using hypnosis and uh, later on he abandoned it and went into a psychoanalysis because he felt hypnosis wasn't fast enough and not everybody could be hypnotized well enough to uh, accomplish what he wanted to do. Uh, some other things happened uh, with hypnosis during the Cold War. Uh, the wonderful CIA in our country decided to use uh, hypnosis, kind of see how effective it was for mind control. They did a lot of studies with uh, hypnosis and a lot of uh, use of LSD at the same time to uh, try to sit there and see if they could get people to do things that uh, they wouldn't have done normally. Uh, and basically almost all those studies failed miserably. Uh, if you wanted somebody to do something, it was easier to give them a lot of money and tell them to go do something than to uh, take the time and effort to uh, try to control their minds. Uh, more currently, uh, Hypnosis is being evaluated more on a scientific approach. Uh, the more interesting things I remember seeing was a study done at Stanford University referred to as the blue ball study. In this particular study, they took uh, people and divided them into groups uh, and gave them a blue ball to put in their hand and you know to touch it and see what 
you know, what it was all about. And they, at the same time, they did EEGs on their brain and see what part of their brain was active dealing with this blue ball. They then did a second part where they told people to imagine they had a blue ball in their hand. And again, did EEGs to sit there and see what part of their brain was active. And it was different parts of the brain, not surprisingly. And the third group, they hypnotized them and through hypnosis told them there was a blue ball in their hand. And it showed up uh, again, do with an EEG, what part of their brain was active. It was interesting that when they actually had a blue ball in their hand, or when they were in hypnosis and had a blue ball in their hand, uh, the brain, the EEG readings, so the brain activity was exactly the same. So in hypnosis, it kind of shows that uh, it's almost like it's really, you're thinking it's almost happening to you as if it was really happening. There's no difference. If you imagine it, it's a, your brain re responds to it differently. Okay, so what is hypnosis? Now, this is kind of like uh, a rabbinic type of thing. If you get uh, three rabbis together to discuss something, you get four opinions. Get three hypnotists together, you get three four opinions of what is hypnosis. Uh, nobody agrees very well on what it's all about. There are very many different theories abound. Uh, the three I just thought I'd mention here is uh, conscious and subconscious. There's two parts of your brain and uh, your uh, subconscious is much more active when you're in hypnosis and your conscious isn't. Uh, other people think it's a right brain, left brain thing. Uh, your right brain, right, right brain tends to be more of the uh, artsy, imaginative part of the brain. The left brain tends to be more of the scientific, analytical part. And uh, in hypnosis, by this theory, your right brain is more active. And there's other theories that say, uh, there is no such thing as hypnosis, really. They're just trying to please the hypnotist. And it's just being uh, kind to the person. Uh, because they can't really prove you know, what's going on when, when you're in hypnosis. But most people generally agree it's an altered mental state. You don't notice anything physically going on. You, know, you, you can't feel different when you're in hypnosis than when you're awake. Uh, a hypnotized person is awake. They're not asleep. Uh, they're totally aware of what's going on around them. When you're in hypnosis, if you have somebody in hypnosis and the phone rings, they hear the phone ringing. You know, uh, it's not like they're uh, unconscious. Uh, they are basically aware of everything that's happening to them. In some cases, they just don't care. And more, most importantly, hypnosis is not mind control. A uh, person who's in hypnosis is not uh, a mindless fool going around doing whatever the hypnotist tells them to do. Personally, I like the uh, conscious versus subconscious mind explanation uh, of what hypnosis is. And uh, your conscious mind will look, listen, learn, reason, judge, analyze, criticize, and accept or reject. So, uh, example, if you had looked out the window of your house before you got on the Zoom call, uh, and you, you know, I had told you that the sky was a pretty uh, green with purple polka dots. You'd sit there and listen to that statement and say, uh, the sky's usually not green, almost never. Uh, it certainly doesn't have purple polka dots. So you reject that uh, explanation or that statement based on your conscious mind. The subconscious mind, on the other hand, runs all your bodily functions. I mean, you don't have to consciously think, oh, time to breathe. Yeah, I haven't done that in a while. It's time to do it. Let's do it again. Uh, or walking. You don't think about lifting right foot, moving it forward, putting it down. You just say, I want to walk to here or there. And you, you know, it's all done on a subconscious level. But the subconscious can, will, and must act out any image, idea, or concept that's put into it. So if your subconscious uh, has a uh, 
program built into it, it's going to follow it. So again, on a subconscious level, if it said the sky was green with purple polka dots, your subconscious would probably say, what shade of green? How big are the purple polka dots? It, accept it as fact without doing the analytical reasoning. So you just act on that behavior. So how does hypnosis work? Hypnosis modifies the subconscious programming to change behaviors without thinking about them. Uh, a good example is uh, smoking. A lot of people who smoke would sit there, finish a meal, and light up a cigarette. It's kind of built-in habit, something they would always do. Uh, if your subconscious breaks that habit, saying, you know, you finished a meal, you don't have to pick up a cigarette, you won't do it. You're not thinking of it. You, you've changed that habit. However, hypnosis cannot change behaviors that involve moral, ethical, or religious beliefs or behaviors. Uh, you can't hypnotize somebody and say, go rob a bank for me. It's not going to work unless, uh, I guess, it might if you're a professional bank robber, but the odds of that are pretty slim. You know, most people have uh, ethical uh, <clears throat> behaviors that won't let them do things of that nature. And hypnotizing won't change that. So who can be hypnotized and who can't be hypnotized? Well, anybody who wants to be can be hypnotized. Usually if you're more intelligent, you may be a better subject for it than if you're a poor subject. Uh, if you, you know, more intelligent, you, you may be a poor, better subject than if you're a, a less intelligent person. Uh, who can't be hypnotized? Anybody who doesn't wanna be. Uh, if you're a very low intelligent, you know, you're uh, mentally very deficient, it's very difficult to be hypnotized because you're unable to focus on what's being said or done. And some people who are extremely paranoid are terrible subjects just because they are very worried of what's going to be done to them when they're hypnotized. So they won't want to go into hypnosis. For the most part, there are two different types of hypnosis that are done that you see around. Uh, typically stage hypnosis or therapeutic type hypnosis. And they have very different uh, goals and uh, aspects to them. Uh, stage hypnosis typically is done for comic entertainment. You know, probably that most people see uh, hit have seen hypnosis done in some kind of a stage show uh, where they bring up a lot of people onto the stage at a time. Uh, the hypnotist selects only the best subjects by doing a few things with them to try to weed out the uh, very hypnotizable people from the less hypnotizable people. And they use the subjects to show off their magical powers of uh, making them do all kinds of often very silly things. And uh, the psychology of the subject is a little different. Here, uh, subjects like to be show-offs. And uh, it's a great excuse for somebody who uh, is kind of a closet uh, show-off that doesn't normally do that because they can get up on stage and act as silly as they want. And the hypnotist made me do it. It wasn't me being silly. You know, I was being forced to do that you know, they get a chance to show off and be, you know, behave a little less than normal. Uh, in therapeutic hy hypnosis, uh, subjects want to make a change to better their self themselves in some way. Uh, we can talk about what we're, what subjects may want to do with that a little later, some of the things they can change with hypnosis, but uh, they're there to make some kind of improvement in their life. And people will come in and they have all different levels of being able to be hypnotized. Uh, some are very good, some are pretty bad. And uh, the therapeutic hypnosis person tends to uh, have to work with the person on, based on their uh, level of abilities. And therapeutic hypnosis is typically done either one-on-one -on -one or maybe in small groups of trying to do the same thing. 
Uh, there are some people who will sit there and you know rent the hall at the Holiday Inn or something and try to bring in a couple hundred people and try to get them all to quit smoking or lose weight or something like that. Uh, but that's uh, kind of hit and miss in my opinion that uh, you know because people have different levels of hypnotizability, they really uh, may not get to the same spot. So it may be much more effective with some and not with others. Who are the best subjects? Well, younger people, teens and college students probably are a little better. They're a little less uh, jaded and a little less concerned about uh, what's happening to them. Uh, women are slightly more hypnotizable than men, but not you know, hugely significantly, but really the best subject is somebody who is motivated to make a change in their life it is the best subject for therapeutic hypnosis. There are many different types of ways of putting people into hypnosis. Uh, some of the oldest ones going back to braid is eye fixation, things like watching the watch, uh, and stare or stare into my eyes or something like that. Uh, but you're very good uh, inductions. People are very familiar with that type of uh, way of putting people into hypnosis. Uh, progressive relaxation type in inductions where you go through and try to relax the body and the mind in a slow, steady pace to get the entire body, entire mind relaxed and put them into hypnosis that way. There are things called instantaneous inductions. And I would list instantaneous as anything that takes less than a minute, uh, which is much more typically used in stage work than it is in a therapeutic work, but it can be done both way in both locations. And that's a way of putting somebody uh, into hypnosis, you know, very, very quickly. Uh, there are things called confusion inductions. This is a way of uh, saying things that are very confusing. You know, the, something like the more you relax, the sleepier you get, the sleepier you get, the more you're awake. Uh, so it's time to get very relaxed. And the person gets so confused by that, it's just easier to go into hypnosis than to sit there and try to fight through uh, logic like uh, Alice in Wonderland type thing. And there are nonverbal inductions, which is used rarely, I think, of these types. This is just uh, with you know, not saying anything. And of course, you have to use these kinds of inductions with somebody who's deaf. But uh, you know, other times you can just do uh, nonverbal inductions through touch. And these days, uh, that's a little more problematic, uh, you know, touching people. So why would you use hypnosis? Uh, there's lots and lots of different reasons. I've done many of these, and I'll just go through some of, some of these and explain uh, how, you know, what you might use it for. Uh, academic applications, uh, teaching people, you know, better study skills, you know, test-taking skills. Uh, a lot of people get very nervous and upset about, uh, anxious about taking, you know, a major test or studying for something. And if you can relax, and you tend to do better. Breaking addictions uh, either uh, can be done. Allergies is kind of a unique, unique one uh, that uh, an allergy often can be considered a uh, a response to a stimulation uh, and your brain can be told to respond differently. Uh, just having a better attitude. Uh, bedwetting is typically, you know, obviously for ki kids. Uh, breast enlargement, generally again for women, uh, which has been shown to work uh, uh, cancer, not so much for curing it, but dealing with the symptoms, uh, especially if you're going through uh, radiation or chemotherapy and being able to handle that better. Uh, career enhancement. 
having a more uh, positive attitude towards uh, your work, improving concentration, uh, dental, going into uh, a dentist's office and not needing Novocaine or anything like that, or not being able to, not having to gag every time the dentist sticks something in your mouth. Uh, fears and phobias very commonly done. Uh, getting rid of uh, some fear, uh, some phobia, you know, so it doesn't bother you anymore. Uh, fitness, you know, exercise more, uh, improve your health uh, in general, how to project your image to others, uh, learning is kind of, kind of goes back to academic. Uh, medical, you can do things uh, medically with hypnosis. Uh, going back to uh, some of the early people, you can have, you know, surgeries totally without anesthesia and just do uh, medical applications, improve your memory. Uh, I've had people come to me, you know, I couldn't remember where they did, did something, misplaced something, couldn't figure out where, where they left it. Go back and uh, relive the sequence and be able to recover uh, something they had forgotten. Uh, that area is uh, kind of fraught with danger because you can, through hypnosis, put in false memories. Tell somebody, you know, that something happened to them, uh, abducted by aliens, you know, take something uh, a little more ridiculous uh, that, uh, that, that, that happened to them. And they might remember that from then on that they were abducted. So a memory is, is a can of worms for a hypnotist. You have to be very careful. Uh, motivation to be more motivated to do things. Uh, certainly is something that you can use hypnosis for, uh, nail chewing, nail biting, whatever you want to refer to that as. It's another kind of a bad habit you can break. Uh, obstetrics, uh, childbirth, going through uh, painless childbirth. Uh, I think many of the, the guys here worry too much about that, but it's something uh, women are much more concerned with. Uh, being able to uh, deal with the pain related to uh, childbirth or just uh, the fear of you know, giving birth. Uh, pain control is a major uh, use for uh, hypnosis. Uh, you can control experiencing pain with hypnosis, but you have to be careful because pain in general is something that your body is telling you there's something wrong and you have to be able to find out why you're experiencing the pain and know from uh, medical evaluation that uh, you just, you know, there is something going on, but then you could sit there and deal with the pain if you know what the source is. Uh, you don't want to use hypnosis just to turn off pain all kinds, you know, all the time, you know, uh, for a good example of that is, you know, you have a burner on a stove on, you put your hand on it. And if you didn't feel any pain, you could seriously hurt yourself. It's good to know that, you know, that pain is there for a reason. So you have to, uh, use that one again with some degree of, uh, awareness of, you know, pain can be a good thing. Uh, if you know what it is and it's not something that you need, you can get rid of it. Uh, performance in general, music, sports, business, all kinds of things. Uh, a lot of people use hypnosis uh, in sports. Uh, people often say, you know, uh, you know, sports is, you know, 90% mental 10% athletic, uh, you know, people like, uh, you know, Michael Jordan would use, sit there and use hypnosis, uh, trying to convince himself, you know, the basket is a huge basket. It's easy to toss the ball into it. Uh, and just become convinced that that's something easy to do as opposed to, oh, that basket is so small and the ball's, you know, I'm so, so far away from it. I'll never make this. If you don't have that mindset, you'll be able to perform better. Uh, golf, if you sit there and you know how, once you learn how to swing the golf club properly, 
you can uh, sit there and just repeat it. You don't have to sit there and worry about think overthinking things because that tends to mess you up more than anything else. Uh, personal relationships, uh, you know, listening to others and de dealing with uh, what they're saying and what they're doing to improve your relationships. Uh, problem solving, you know, being able to focus and think about things and uh, from all angles. Uh, reading, speed, comprehension, all can be improved. Uh, sales, you know, a lot of salesmen, uh, salespersons will come in and say, you know, going into a sale, they're very worried that they're not going to make it. And if they don't make enough sales, they're not going to uh, make their quotas, et cetera, et cetera, and come in. And uh, you can use hypnosis to improve their confidence in themselves and their ability to sell make better presentations. Uh, sex issues, uh, dysfunctions, inhibitions, pleasure. Uh, <clears throat> for men, sometimes uh, things like premature ejaculation, women not being able to uh, orgasm, things like that, all can be uh, dealt with through hypnosis. Uh, sleeping, uh, more better, less, yeah, all that is possible. Uh, sleeping at an inappropriate time. I had, know I had at least one client who want, liked to fall asleep while they were driving. Hmm. Not a good situation to be in. So uh, again, uh, I was able to work with them and you know keep them awake while they were driving. Uh, smoking cessation, very common use for hypnosis. A uh, little less active in that area because more people have quit smoking over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, speech, being able to speak better, clearer, in pub speaking in public in front of crowds. Uh, sports performance, again, uh, stress management, you know, dealing with stress. Stress is a, a major factor in our lives these days. And if you can't handle it well, you know, hypnosis is a great way to uh, help deal with stress and weight weight loss, uh, dieting, eating disorders, worked with all kinds of people trying to lose weight or, you know, being able to eat vegetables that they couldn't stand eating or whatever before that it was something that they, uh, you know, eat a healthier lifestyle because they weren't able to eat uh, a proper diet. So those are, uh, a, as you can see, a lot of different areas that you can use hypnosis for. Uh, the only person who's ever come to me with something uh, that I sat there, said, I have no idea how to uh, work with hypnosis was trying to prevent baldness. <laughs> uh, I've never read anybody <laughs> working in that area. Uh, to grow hair through hypnosis, uh, but almost everything else uh, that I've run across can be. Personally, I don't work in all these areas uh, just because, you know, some of them are fairly specialized and uh, you need a fair amount of experience in those areas, which I personally don't have, so I stay away from them. Uh, for those of you who might have uh, interest in talking with me uh, or have other questions that you don't want to put online, some uh, information for me. I am in uh, Buffalo Grove, Illinois area. Uh, hypnosis does work either in person or on Zoom or through the internet. It can be done both ways. Uh, I think most hypnotists prefer doing it in person, but uh, you know, as we've learned in the last few years, that's not always possible. So uh, it can be something that's uh, done uh, over the internet. And at this point, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, Sandy, in the chat, there was a question posed. Does, do people need to be hypnotized or re-hypnotized to continue with the benefits received? Uh, Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, many people uh, will be hypnotized once and uh, they're good after that forever. 
Hmm. I know I've helped people quit smoking. And in one, maybe two sessions, you know, they're non-smokers for the rest of their lives. Other things uh, are a little more tricky, uh, like eating, dieting. Uh, no matter what you do as a hypnotist, you can't uh, hypnotize somebody into not eating forever. Uh, it's something that they're going to want to do a again. So uh, you have to, you may have to, in something like that, uh, periodically uh, get back and get hypnotized again. But for the most part, uh, hypnosis will work, you know, for an extremely long period of time. And uh, you may have touched on, or you did touch on it. How many sessions does it take to make a difference? And uh, does it last? I think you okay. uh, well, yeah. It depends on what you're doing. Something where uh, it's you're either doing it or not doing it, uh, is, like smoking, uh, can last forever. Uh, things that you're going to continue doing on a regular basis, uh, maybe you know, need more, the time, more time. In my personal practice, I typically work with a uh, client for uh, at least three, period, three times. The first time being a get together, an introduction, you know, explain what hypnosis is, uh, what discuss what they want to do with it, and uh, do some evaluation of whether they're a good subject for hypnosis or not. Uh, but the second time, actually, do some hypnosis with them to uh, work towards whatever they're going for, and a third session to try to make sure everything is working right. And uh, if more is needed, depending on what it is, uh, schedule more sessions at that point. You know, for weight loss, you know, I, you can hypnotize somebody to, uh, you know, eat better and lose weight, but that's not an instantaneous process. You know, uh, if you're going to lose 100 pounds, that's not going to happen after one session of hypnosis. That's going to be a continuing thing for a period of time. So it, it, it varies. Is it covered by insurance? Uh, rarely. Uh, some insurances will cover it for uh, some aspects. Uh, smoking, I think, is often covered. Uh, sometimes for medical procedures or uh, like anesthesia during uh, surgery, uh, that may be covered by uh, insurance. But if you want to sit there and uh, play better golf, it's probably not going to be covered. Okay. Uh, we had a question. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself uh, to ask the question, uh, Mike Greenberg. I see Mike Weintraub. Yeah, Michael, Weintraub, Michael Weintraub had his hand up before I did. So okay. I'm going to turn it to Michael first. Okay. Michael Weintraub, I think you had a question. Yes. Uh, actually, two questions. Uh, first of all, thank you. Great presentation. Um, the first question is, so I've been a, a triathlete for many, many years. And um, in 80% of my swims, I would swim out 200 yards. It could be a half mile uh, swim or a mile swim or a two mile swim. and I don't know if it was panic attack or what, but I would go into uh, this type of panic attack. It would last 30 seconds, a minute, and then I'd be fine again. I actually did go to a hypnotist, and, and this was just within the last year after 25 years of experiencing this. And um, I never felt that I was put under. I mean, I was totally aware of everything. It was like a meditation almost. Mm -hmm. And I've done a few races since then without any issues at all. And my question to her, and I'll pose it to you, is uh, she never at, she asked me about whether there was a root cause, whether there was some traumatic experience. I don't ever remember there being any, but in your experience, 
do you typically go for a root cause or really doesn't it make a difference uh, in proceeding with whatever the issue is? Uh, generally, I do, you know, in my first session, do some exploration of what you might think the root cause is, but I don't spend a lot of time trying to find out for sure what the root cause was, because it's basically not that important. It, if there is a root cause and it happened sometime in the past and you can't remember what that was, yeah, okay, it happened. Let's deal with the uh, after effects of that and make sure it doesn't happen in the future. So, yeah. And the second question is with respect to memory, um, can you uh, deal with people that are cognitively impaired with respect to short term memory? Uh, I haven't done a lot of that, frankly. Because uh, <clears throat> if you're having a lot of short term memory issues, you probably. Uh, on the poorest scale of being able to be hypnotized. Uh, but yeah, the, you could, you can do that. I just don't personally have that much experience with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your questions, Michael. Uh, yeah. Mike Greenberg. Hi, Sandy, thanks for a great presentation first. Thank you. So, um, it sounds like you've set up a business um, and as a medical business, can you talk to us a little bit about your malpractice um, insurance or liability insurance? Have you set up uh, from a business side, a, um, a corporation or a limited liability corporate, uh, you know, corporation? Uh, okay. Uh, basically I am not, and do not try to represent myself as a medical professional or a uh, psychology psychiatrist or psychologist. Excuse me. So I, I'm not practicing med medicine. I'm dealing with symptoms people have expressed. It, you know, I'm not trying to cure their pain. I'm sitting there trying to deal with a way of coping with their pain, for example. Uh, so uh, really there's very limited uh, you know, medical uh, malpractice that can be uh, brought. Uh, there are insurance people that will you know, uh, deal with that uh, to, to make sure you're covered if you, you, know, you do set up this business, but the biggest thing is to stay out of, you know, being, you know, uh, being concerned with practicing, trying to practice medicine or psychiatry. But you could still be sued even for you. Yeah, you can be sued anytime. To, yes. Yeah, but don't you have liability insurance? For yes. That? But I mean, you can be sued for anything, you know, so. Yeah, but you're, 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 you're essentially. You're not putting myself out more than you would. For yeah, absolutely. I mean, as an author, I have to take liability insurance. Yeah. Right. And so that uh, I was just wondering, you know, because in, in your case, it's you're dealing more with the public about dealing with certain medical related issues. Yeah, um, but I'm not treat. I'm not medically treating them. That's a, that's why uh, the liability is much less. But in your list. Yeah. Things that you talk about that hypnotist or hypnosis could help deal with. And those are, some of them are considered diseases, like cigarette smoking is an addiction or drug use is an addiction. Right. You know, so and it I, sort of gets dicey. I don't, you know. It, it, you're, you're on a fine line sometimes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sandy. Okay. Can you describe a little bit about referral sources? Are they like um, mental health professionals or physicians or, um, I don't know, word of mouth, clergy? Oh. More word of mouth for me personally. Uh, you know, I have had uh, doctors or uh, dentists refer people to me to uh, <clears throat> see if they I can help them with uh, some aspect of what they're doing. Uh, 
especially in pain management. Uh, and, you know, I'm teaching them <clears throat> ways of dealing, you know, coping with, de with pain as opposed to trying to actually stop pain, which is what, you know, a doctor would give somebody, you know, a drug uh, or a dentist, you know, like giving you a shot of Novocaine or something like that. You know, I, I'm not allowed to do stuff like that, but I can help them through visualization and uh, thought processes to sit there and cope with the pain. For example, I've heard of people being able to, I don't know if you'd call it self hypnosis, but just before a medical procedure, sort of think themselves into a, a state where they don't need anesthesia, like dental stuff. Yes. I, I, I freak my, the first time I went into my dentist uh, trying to, I think he was doing cavity, he was, you know, drilling away and said, oh, I'll get you a shot of Novocaine. I said, no, I don't need it. Just give me two minutes. So people can and, do it. No you know, it was so weird, you know, I didn't get a discount for not using the Novocaine. But, uh, <laughs> but people can learn to apply. You can learn to do that. that. Yes. Wow. That's cool. I heard a humorous reference a guy made to his unconscious by calling his subnoxious. That was kind of cute. Yeah. <laughs> no, but there are people uh, who can go in through, uh, you know, major surgery uh, without any anesthetic just using hypnosis mm. and the stories they tell the doctors are freaked out because you're sitting there, <laughs> you know, they're talking to each other and, you know, the patient chimes in on something. Oh, I, you know, had this story one time, you know, they're not used to that sort of thing. <laughs> well, uh, Sandy, what about, uh, there, there was a question about dealing with mental, mental issues. Is that uh, something that you can respond to? Depends on what the issue is. Uh, and you may, whether it's me or some other hypnotist, may be able to do more with some mental issues or not. You know, it depends on what it is uh, and what, you know, what they want, you know, what the person wants to accomplish. So it's really hard to be specific on uh, right. what that particular mental issue is. You know, if you're, uh, you know, uh, paranoid or schizophrenic, that's probably for something, uh, you know, a doctor you know, somebody who's more qualified to deal with okay. rather than a hypnotist. Okay. Are there any other questions at this point? Uh, yeah, no, uh, I am. I, I've got another one for Sandy. Sandy, okay. yeah. um, by, by training, you're, you're an engineer and you've had a, looks like he had a, a, a really nice long career as a, as an engineer. Uh, yes. So how did you get into being a hypnotist what what sort of motivated you when... okay yeah uh my actual college degree was in engineering and uh my first assignment out to the field i had to go climb up on some equipment in a plant and they had these metal open air uh stairways and handrails uh and I had to go climbing up i don't know a couple hundred feet into the air and it, I didn't know heights bothered me uh, until, until then, uh, you know, being able to look, you know, being on airplanes and, you know, other places didn't bother me, but that, you know, kind of shook me up. So I sat there and said, you know, if I'm going to be doing this on a regular basis, I need to deal with this uh, fear of being up in the air this way. So I found uh, my <clears throat> first class that was being offered on, you know, helping yourself with hypnosis. I think it was the title of it. So, yeah. How bad can that be? You know, hypnosis is always kind of something you had seen in the movies or on TV. So it seemed kind of neat. So I went and took the class and uh, through the efforts of, you know, the, the instructor and my own efforts, uh, I was able to get over that fear. So I was able to, you know, climb on stuff uh, out in the field, and it didn't bother me anymore, because I basically convinced myself that as long as you're doing something safe, it doesn't make any difference if that walkway is two feet off the ground or 200 feet off the ground, as long as it's safe, and because of that, uh, I got over it and uh, said, hey, this is really neat, and then started to uh, pursue this as uh, another interest. Great background on that. Uh, I can recall a number of years ago, I was placed on a 
uh, shaft that went uh, over at McCormick Road in Skokie, Chicago, uh, the border there, uh, on the excavation of the deep tunnel project uh, through the uh, Metropolitan, at that time, Metropolitan Sanitary District of uh, Chicago. And there were no handrails on this platform. All I was really relying on was that I would stand still long enough to go uh, 200 feet into, into the ground. And I could have used you then. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, anyone else with questions? Oh, Michael? You yeah, one more. Can you explain the difference? Uh, I, I know between people that uh, have absolutely no memory of being hypnotized versus those like me who remember everything and feel that I really never was put under, it was more meditative. Is there a difference between being fully under, so to speak, or having no memory versus uh, being conscious the whole time? Is there any difference or effectiveness between okay. kind of those two? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, most people, uh, you know, will never feel any different being in hypnosis or not being in hypnosis. You know, it, there's no physical sensation. It's not like you get hit over the head with a two by four saying you are awake and conscious and everything was going on and then whack, you're in hypnosis and uh, it's a totally different experience. Uh, you, you don't get that sensation uh, of being in hypnosis. Uh, with memory, that's one of those things uh, that's a measure of how deeply hypnotized you are. Uh, some people will spontaneously, uh, you know, when they go into hypnosis, will not remember anything that happened until they come back out of, out of it. Uh, other people remember everything all the way through. If that's something that worries somebody, I always make, uh, you know, a, a suggestion to them if they're, if they're worried about it in my uh, pre-consultation, that if you you know if you're a good subject you may not remember what happens if that bothers you I'll make sure I give you a suggestion that you will remember everything that happened to you, so uh, you don't have to worry about you know I'm I'm doing something weird <laughs> to you while you're in hypnosis. Uh, also with that line, uh, if somebody wants to bring a chaperone along, I always allow people to bring chaperones along, just so uh, they can make sure they're okay. You know they're their personal interests are taken care of. But uh, memory and hypnosis is a measure of depth, of how, how deeply under. In the conscious, subconscious metal model, it's what percentage of your conscious mind uh, is turned off, is a measure of how deeply into hypnosis you are. And, and is it more effective if you're more deeply uh, involved or more, if you get more deeply? Um, into it depends what you're doing. Uh, for some things, uh, being very deeply into hypnosis is much better. Certainly, if you're doing stage work, it's great. Uh, if you're doing therapeutic work, it, you don't have to be uh, you know, a super deep subject for it to be effective. Do you ever work with people who have uh, motion sickness in varying degrees? Um, I have very, very mild motion sickness, which pops up once in a while in my job which involves flying on airplanes. And when it gets turbulent, really very turbulent, uh, I, I do feel it at times. Have you ever worked with um, that sort of problem? And I, my wife has much worse uh, motion sickness, but um, what, what do you think about that? Uh, per, uh, to ask the first part of the question, uh, I haven't done a lot with motion sickness per yeah. se. Yeah. Uh, I've done with other things with you know flying and being a, you know, nervous and upset, and that may contribute to the motion sickness. Yeah, not in uh, my case. No, it's really very, under high turbulence is, is okay. the problem. Yeah. But again, being under high turbulence, you might uh, start thinking, th you know, something's going on and, you know, that may uh, relate to a you know, habitual type thing of getting motion sickness. Yeah. And maybe it would help. I, I'm just not, you know, the expert in that particular category category of uses yeah but i think i i don't think it uh it would be something that hypnosis couldn't help you with yeah thank you thank you larry thank you uh 
So it's just about 10 o'clock uh, central uh, time on Sunday, and I want to thank, first of all, our presenter for uh, a wonderful uh, presentation, explanation of uh, hypnosis and its applications. Thank you, Sandy, for a great presentation. You're welcome. And uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for joining us this morning on this FJMC-sponsored webinar. If there are those that you know that uh, either had a conflict or some other activity or commitment this morning that made it difficult for them to uh, view this uh, uh, over this time frame, uh, it is recorded and they can reference it uh, once it's uh, properly uh, placed on, this, on the uh, archive of previous presentations, all of which can be reviewed at any particular time if you uh, have, uh, have the time and, and desire to go through the uh, list of topics. We will be offering future programs. We encourage your participation. Uh, these are available to not only those within the FJMC, any friends, other family members that would like to attend can do so by uh, capturing the link and accessing it uh, as the program begins. I uh, want to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah. And uh, again, thank you for your attention this morning and the courtesies afforded to uh, Sandy with uh, muting so we uh, could avoid any possible distractions. Again, thank you for your time and your interest and have a great day. And uh, if you want to reach uh, Sandy directly, uh, if you want to, uh, we uh, will have that slide available, which will show his contact information, uh, including his email and uh, Chicago area phone number. So that'll be our program for today. And thank you for your time and uh, have a good day. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank thank you. you.